Summer's supposed to be a time for laying back, taking it easy, and maybe even touching some grass, but seems like once again the anime industry has missed that memo. With Bleach, Horimiya, Mushoku Tensei, Jujutsu Kaisen, and Bungo Stray Dogs all returning this season, plus rent a girlfriend for the Stockholm Syndrome victims out there, I'm sure a lot of you already have a lot on your plates already, but that's not gonna stop me from heaping a bunch of great new stuff on there too. This is one of those seasons with a bit of something for everyone. If you like music, Music, mecha, fantasy, sci-fi, romance, comedy, action, or horror, I guarantee you're about to pick up at least one new personal fave. Maybe more if you stick around to the bargain bin. These are the ones to watch for summer 2023, brought to you by Mad Tail. Mad Tail is a new idol RPG from Arkasar Games that puts a dark yet charmingly animated twist on your favorite fairy tales. In order to save the Mad Tail fairyland from encroaching evil, you'll recruit a vast army of iconic characters with entertainingly twisted personalities. From a wicked and manipulative Snow White, to a gold digging Cinderella and her foot fetishy Prince Charming, to a valiant wolf mounted warrior woman take on Little Red Riding Hood. The game offers new players over a thousand free draws to get your collection started, too. Once your squad's assembled, you can take them into automatic idle battles on the main quest line, delve into randomly generated roguelike adventures in the polluted prison, or take on a gauntlet of bosses in the underground ruins. Or, if you're feeling really confident in your battle strategy, you can enter the PvP arena to dominate your fellow players and maybe even make some friends along the way. Speaking of friends, your fairy tale partners will work to gather resources for you even when you're away from the game, so you'll always find something new waiting whenever you log in. If you're looking for a fun strategic challenge with a side of fairy tale whimsy, look no further. Download Mad Tail from your app store of choice today and use gift code MADTAILGO to get started with 50 diamonds, 50,000 EXP, and 100,000 coins. Moving on to the anime, if twisted takes on classic folklore are your thing, then you'll definitely want to give Undead Murder Farce a shot. Directed by Shinichi Omata, the man who made Kaguya-sama and Rakugo Shinju looks so damn good, this atmospheric and action-packed detective tale takes us to an alternate history Meiji era where Japan's emperor has vowed to eradicate all yokai in the name of westernization. Our let's call him a hero, the half-oni Tsugaru, works in a circus sideshow, beating other supernatural critters to death for the entertainment of the braying masses, and biding his time until his demonic side finally consumes him and gives him an excuse to show those foolish, cruel humans what it's really like inside his cage. That all changes one night, though, when a mysterious maid comes knocking with an intriguing proposition. Her mistress, Aya, is an immortal who can help forestall Sugaru's impending demise in exchange for one small favor. All he's got to do is kill her. Oni have the power to undo supernatural healing factors, you see, and after another half-Oni decapitated her and stole her body, Aya doesn't see much point in carrying on as a disembodied head in a birdcage. As luck would have it, though, that Oni's master is the same man who turned Sugaru into a monster, and so he makes her a counteroffer. They'll travel to Europe as an intrepid mystery-solving trio, working their way through the supernatural community until they eventually track the top-hatted villain down. Of course, Aya thinks that sounds like a fun time, and if you give this show a watch, I think you'll agree. Between that series and My Happy Marriage, it's a very good season to be a supernatural alt-history enjoyer. At first blush, Netflix's new simuldub series seems to just be a Cinderella-esque romantic period drama about a downtrodden young lady who escapes a life of toil under her wicked stepmom and cruel half-sister into an arranged marriage that turns out better than she feared. And it's a pretty good one of those at that, with gorgeous background art, slick animation, and mellow dramatic direction that really tugs at the old heartstrings with all the ways that Mio is beaten down and her memories of her mom are literally stomped on by all the mean people around her. But then the other old-timey wooden sandal drops, and we learn why her callous father consigned her to a life of servitude while spoiling Kaya, the child of his second marriage. See, this version of Japan has been beset since ancient times by ghostly grotesqueries that can only be seen by a gifted few. Those born with the sight also gain incredible powers to help fight those monsters as they age, making them highly valued in Japanese society, 
And unlike her sister, Mio didn't inherit the psionic birthright of the Sionji clan. So the only use her dad has for her is as a pawn for building alliances with other powerful families. And considering the troubling rumors surrounding Captain Kyoka Kudo and the last few fiancés who've left him, that seems like an ideal place to pawn his more disposable daughter off. Luckily for Mio, her husband-to-be's failings are even more overstated than her own, as you could probably guess from the lack of a slash S after the show's title. I mean, he clearly has some trust issues, likely stemming from a past trauma of his own, but that just gives these newlyweds something to bond over. Sin Duality Noir is one of them nonsense anime titles made of bash together foreign words that tells you very little about the thing it's attached to besides that it's probably got some mecha in it. And indeed, this show probably does. Specifically, cute, chunky-looking mechs that require an R2-D2 shaped like a hot lady, or sometimes a butler, in order to pilot them properly, which are used by professional scavengers to fend off deadly hordes of monster bugs as they scour a lush, post-apocalyptic landscape for old-world resources. Yeah, despite this being a semi-original anime, developed in tandem with a pretty fun-looking game that's due out later this year, there's not much about Sin Duality's premise that's all that original. But whether that will make the show derivative or classically inspired depends largely on how it's executed. And unless you're CGI-phobic, I think the dynamic, energetic action that you're seeing now kind of speaks for itself. Depending on your taste, the colorful industrial pop art setting, which feels distinctly Eureka 7 adjacent, may also really speak to you. Personally, what spoke to me were the characters, who managed to display quite a bit of personality and charm and not a lot of screen time, thanks to the rich and economical script writing of Bunny Girl Senpai and Pet Girl of Sakura So creator Hajime Kamoshida who's also credited for cooking up the concept of this whole mixed-media project, just FYI. And as a big fan of his other works, that alone is enough to make me want to give it a shot. And hey, if you've already re-upped your Hulu or Disney Plus for the new Bleach, you may as well do otherwise. Also, it's a very good time to catch up on last season's Tengoku Daimakyo, and especially last year's Summertime Rendering, which you really should not look up anything about before you go watch it. Just trust me, go in blind. On a possibly related note, anime often struggles to deliver effective horror for reasons I delved into ages ago in this video. So I always see it as something special when an anime does manage to genuinely spook me. And boy howdy, is Dark Gathering ever special. Keitaro Gintoga hates ghosts, which is unfortunate because they absolutely love him. Everywhere he goes, spirits follow. They can't resist the pull of his presence. And two years ago, that caused an incident which badly hurt one of his friends and left him a total shut-in. Slowly but surely, though, he's been rebuilding his life with the help of cheerful childhood friend Eiko, getting back into college with the grades-to-be class rep, even, and taking up tutoring on the side to make some extra cash and slowly work on his confidence. However, his first student, who also happens to be Eiko's little cousin, Yayoi, threatens to undo all of that progress. See, the skulls in that girl's eyes ain't just for show. Before they died in a tragic car accident, her parents even took her to the doctor over them. But luckily, her double pupils don't seem to impair her vision. The second pair just lets her see into the spirit world, which doesn't bother her one bit. In fact, Yayoi wants to see ghosts more than anything. But in spite of her abilities, she kinda needs Keitaro to help her do that, because the thing is, most ghosts are fucking terrified of this girl. Thanks to masterfully tense direction, bone-chilling sound design, and a splattering of body horror, I was feeling a similar sort of way by the time this pilot episode was through. And as someone who knows the joy of a good scare, I loved every second of it. Speaking of rare genre anime, Summers also graced us with some very solid hard sci-fi in the robot doctor drama The Gene of I. Uh, to clarify, Hikaru Sudo is a doctor for robots of the sentient, indistinguishable from people variety, which make up like 10% of Earth's population in this anime setting. He is not a robot himself. 
Though his mom is a robot, and also in jail, because she naively let some corporate grifters copy her personality, which is very, very, very illegal, because nobody wants to deal with the thorny philosophical implications of two different versions of the same guy walking around. Or like, whether or not a robot who's been restored from a backup is actually the same person, or your real mom is dead forever, and now you're stuck with an imperfect clone that can only remind you of the pain, just for example. But of course, if your ears and or other body parts perked up when you heard me say the words hard sci-fi, you do want to wrestle with exactly those sorts of thorny issues, and lucky for you, since Pseudo just so happens to be working as an illegal back-alley robot doctor to find leads on rogue copies of his mom around the world, he's a prime protagonist vehicle for doing exactly that. Speaking of vehicles, there's a scene I really enjoyed early on where Pseudo tells his self-driving car that he'd rather drive to a place himself, and the car's all like, I'm afraid that will void your insurance, Dave. And, you know, that, that's probably all I really needed to say to hook exactly the kind of people who will love this show the most. In a similar vein, many of you will be intrigued to hear that Reign of the Seven Spellblades opens with a curly-haired brunette student of its magic school arguing with her dumber, red-headed classmate about how trolls should have rights, and then actually goes on to validate and explore the nuances of her point of view. Yup! If you, like me, were spurred into a lifelong love of fantasy by formative experiences reading Harry Potter, only to go back as an adult and realize the books aren't all that good, actually, this is the anime for you. Also, if you're about to comment that Harry Potter is good, actually, go read some Earthsea or Discworld and get back to me on that. Seven Spellblades is set at Kimberly Magic Academy, a big castle that's much much bigger on the inside, where the scions of old wizarding families and the occasional gifted child of non-magic folk come to hone their natural talents and unlock the secrets of the supernatural. Many of the school's graduates have gone on to change the world, but only 80% of those who enroll even make it that far. The other 20 find themselves driven mad, dragged back to the dungeon dimensions by products of botched summonings, or otherwise end up irreparably effed up by arcane forces beyond reason. Lost to the spell is the preferred in-universe euphemism. This is a world where whimsy and wonder go hand in hand with danger and darkness, and partly because of that, the magic really feels magical. We're introduced to more fascinating flora, fauna, and phenomena in episode one than many fantasy anime get to in a whole season. And the episode manages to balance that against a generous helping of well-animated action and some solid, appealing character development for all six members of its core cast. As a man who loves his fantasy, Seven Spellblades impressed me on basically every level. And as a man who loves his comedy, Helk did much the same. Ahem. <clears throat> as the kingdoms of men celebrate the defeat of the Demon King, the residents of the Demon Realm are holding a grand tournament to crown their new ruler. The mightiest fighters from across the land have gathered to prove their might and earn the right to lead the next charge against humanity. And the warrior most favored to win the day is a human hero. Oh. This summer, Vimirio the Red is about to find out that... Uh... I haven't really read ahead in the manga, so hard for me to say what's gonna happen. Also, trailer voice is murder on my throat, so um, I think I'm gonna drop this bit. I can tell you that in episode one, that Sundere demon cutie and her uh, skeleton narwhal sidekick concoct all sorts of kooky schemes to stop Helk from winning the tournament, all of which of course fail hilariously, but I don't want to spoil those very good jokes. And also, the end of the episode suggests the series might be heading in a different, but very interesting direction from the pure comedy of that premiere. People who have read the manga are calling this the sleeper hit of the season, and I'll say in some variation of, oh man, this gets so good, enjoy the ride. So I think I'm gonna take that advice and see where it goes. So far, the humor and characters have me hooked, and I think they'll do the same for a lot of 
of you. All told, it's been a surprisingly great year for fans of fantasy that don't need anyone to get hit with a truck before they get rolling. But it's even more surprising that one of Summer's best examples of that sort of thing turned out to be a Love Live spin-off. When Yohane the Parhelion, Sunshine in the Mirror, was first announced, a lot of people thought it was a joke. Understandably, since Bandai did drop the trailer on April 1st. But many also thought the concept of an alternate world story starring the alter ego of Love Live Sunshine's resident Chunibyo Yohane was too brilliant not to be real. And they were thus delighted that summer when the studio turned around to say, <laughs> unless. If you don't know your love lives, Sunshine is widely considered to be the best of the bunch, and fans are absolutely reveling in this chance to see a new side of their favorite girls. But even for someone who's never seen Sunshine like me, also I haven't watched that Idol anime, this show is a blast. Even if idols aren't your thing, if you like your anime off the wall and over the top, Sunshine in the Mirror might just change that for you. That said, if you do prefer fantasies that start off with a car accident, we still got you covered. Reborn as a vending machine, I now wander the dungeon, sounds like the punchline to the setup that is like every other light novel title in the last decade and a half. Short of that time I got reincarnated as a kitchen sink, it's hard to imagine a better single sentence summary of the state of this genre. I mean, it sounds like a story that was written on a drunken bet, like, bro, you can't just make an isekai about literally anything. What if a guy was reincarnated as a fucking vending machine, huh? What would he do then? If you think about it though, that's actually a fantastic story prompt. Like. What would you do in a fantasy world if you couldn't fight monsters, walk, or affect the outside world in any way other than dispensing tasty refreshments? How do you flirt with your complimentary waifu when the only words you can say are hello, goodbye, please insert coin, thank you for your business, and if you win, you get another one for free? I mean, at least at first, the unnamed vending machine otaku who's reborn as Boxo is a bit too busy being horny for efficient and affordable food and beverage service to even think about flirting with Lammy, the inhumanly strong hunter girl who hauls his half-ton ass back to town, but his limited vocabulary and range of motion does still pose other interesting challenges, and his power to magically add anything that he consumed in his past life to his inventory and upgrade his body with cooling and heating features, plus a smidge of defensive magic, provides some genuinely unique and interesting solutions to those problems. This is the first time in a long time that my brain hasn't immediately checked out of an anime the second Protag Kun opened his stat screen. You probably haven't given this show much thought if you know about it at all, but Reborn as a Vending Machine is actually Unironically, one of the most original and entertaining anime you can watch this year, isekai or otherwise. It really goes to show that artists with vision can find a fresh angle on even the most rotten of genres. On that note, one of the few things more ubiquitous than isekai anime is zombie, well, everything. People were calling the zombie market oversaturated back in the dot hack dark ages. And yet, we've seen plenty of wonderful and unique zombie stories in the years since then. Adapted by Komi Can't Communicate director Kazuki Kawagoe from an excellent manga by Alice in Borderlands Aso Haro, Zom 100 Bucket List of the Dead earns its place among those by mixing bright, energetic action with incredibly dark undertones. Imagine, if you will, a fate far worse than death. Shuffling through the motions, all sense of purpose long forgotten, your sunken eyes stare unblinking at nothing as the minutes melt into hours, melt into days. Meals mark the only break from the monotony when you're lucky enough to catch one, but once you're done devouring, all that's left is more aimless toil till it's time to eat once more. Unless, that is, you have the luck to randomly shamble in front of something fast and heavy enough to end your pitiful 
mockery of life. Working in a white-collar sweatshop like that? A zombie plague starts looking less like an apocalypse and more like an extended vacation. So naturally, after marketing wage slave Akira Tendo's apartment manager tries to chew his face off, all he can really think about is how he'll never have to see his other manager's ugly mug ever again. After three years of non-stop 9 to 5, AM to AM grind, our heroes finally got his humanity back. And with a hundred goals to tick off his bucket list, from getting wasted and watching movies all day to confessing to his secret crush, he intends to seize every new day like it might be his last. Cause, you know, one of them probably will be before too long. Hilarious, heartfelt, and action-packed, ZOM 100 paints in sharp, vibrant, delightfully violent contrast the difference between surviving and truly living. With that, we've reached the end of our top 10. But if you haven't had your fill of anime yet, just follow me out back and we'll take a dig through the bargain bin. First up is Level 1 Demon Lord and One Room Hero, a fantasy comedy that just barely got edged off the list by Helk. The series follows a defeated, kind of gender-fluid demon lord who reincarnates prematurely as a Level 1 gremlin to get their revenge on Max, the hero who killed them, before he dies. But they're shocked to discover that in the last 10 years, Max has become a washed-up coomer shut-in after a string of celebrity scandals, and in Instead, they decide to help him get back on his feet in order to knock him back down properly. It's kind of a weird premise, but there's a lot of laughs to be found here, and at least a couple very nice butts. If you're in the market for those, this is a pretty good season for it, actually. Tenpuru, No One Can Live on Loneliness, adapts a harem manga from the same artist as Grand Blue about a young man named Akimitsu Akagami who's completely sworn off women after his dad abandoned him to pursue hookups around the globe. When his impure thoughts finally prove too much to bear, he decides to leave society behind and become a monk. But it turns out the temple he was recommended to has actually been converted to a nunnery full of extremely hot women, including the one who broke the dam on all his pent-up horny, so obviously he can't stay there for lots of reasons. Except it also turns out that his piece of shit dad owes that temple a lot of money, so now he can as their slave. The plot on this one's kinda all over the place, but the plot really makes up for it. And the humor feels like a throwback to old school harem anime in a mostly pretty good way. On the more fantastical end of the harem spectrum, Classroom for Heroes is set at Rosewood Academy, a school established by the hero who beat the Demon King, no relation, in order to train other heroes to Yada yada yada. The series follows a mysteriously overdesigned transfer student named Blade, who is incredibly OP, but was apparently even more OP at some point in his mysterious past, on his quest to have a normal high school experience and make at least a hundred friends. And of course, many of those friends will be hot girls, starting with a tsundere who's possessed by a demon. But I'm sure I'll be telling you more about both of those on The Hottest Trash. While we're on an isekai-ish note, I may as well knock out the other two of those this season that are actually decent. Sweet Reincarnation follows a world-class candy chef who gets sent to another world after being crushed by his own candy sculpture, where he's determined to fulfill his dream of building a kingdom of sweets. Though he has to balance that goal against his political duties as the son of a minor feudal lord, which are actually pretty interesting when they get into the nitty-gritty. Between all that and a surprisingly deep ritualistic magic system, this kind of feels like we have ascendance of a bookworm at home, and I love bookworms, so I'm not gonna complain about that. Speaking of things like other things I like, the most heretical last boss queen from villainous to savior is one of them increasingly common anime about an ordinary girl who gets reborn as the villainous of her favorite visual novel and tries not to go down the evil route that ends with her dying horribly. The twist here, though, is that when she changes things, other characters see visions of her misdeeds in the other timeline, which makes the whole proceeding less comedic and a lot more melodramatic than, say, Baccarina. With a lot, I mean, a lot more crying. You're gonna need some tissues for this one. For pure and wholesome reasons. If your mind went to the gutter when I said that, you might appreciate My Tiny Senpai. A workplace comedy about a guy whose office senpai is, get this, tiny, except in one key area. Also, everything they say and do is very easy to misconstrue as something sexual. That's pretty much the whole joke, I 
Hope you enjoy it. The much more interesting office comedy of the season is The Masterful Cat is Depressed Again Today. A story of a ditzy salary woman living alone with her cat, who just happens to be like six feet tall and does all the cooking and cleaning. As you may be able to tell from the terrible CGI backgrounds, this one's a go-hands anime, but they mostly held themselves back from getting too go-handsy with the camera, unlike their other thing this season, and it's pretty charming and funny overall. If you, like me, are a cat owner, you'll be pleased to know that Yukichi acts a lot like an actual cat, except the part where he's actually useful. Uh, and it's very cute to watch. You can go now. If you're looking to look at some actually good CGI animation, Sanzigen has a new Bang Dream spin-off out. It's My Go, which follows a new band of girls as they band together to form a band at a different all-girls high school from the main series. If you like the idea of idol anime, but you wish they'd play rock music instead of pop, uh, that's this franchise in a nutshell. And as for how that music is, uh, let's just say they're not lying when they put bang in the title. Holy crap, the bargain bin sure was stuffed this season. I told you there was a bit of something for everyone. Hopefully, between that and the main list, which I'll throw on screen one more time for your convenience, you found something for you. And, uh, if you found too many things for you, and I just ruined your plans to catch up on other anime this season, I'm not sorry. You knew what you were getting into. I'm Jeff Thu, harbinger of your endless backlog, disappearing into like a portal or something, because we have a green screen. We can do that now. Oh wow! This effect is so realistic! <laughs>